webinar, Managers as Mentors, Building Partnerships for Learning, hosted by HRDQU and presented by Dr. Chip Bell. Today's webinar will last approximately an hour. Now before we begin, note that there is a chat window. It's usually located in the upper right hand corner of your screen. You can use this section during the webinar to submit any questions that you may have. And then we'll answer those questions as they come in or by email after the session. My name is Sarah Montgomery, and I will moderate today's webinar. I am in business development for HRDQ, a publisher of research-based training solutions that improve the performance of individuals, teams, and organizations. Our presenter today is Chip Bell. Chip is a well-known consultant, a sought-after speaker, and founder of the Chip Bell Group. He is the author and co-author of several best-selling books, including Nine and a Half Principles of Innovative Service, Take Their Breath Away, Managers as Mentors, and Managing Knock Your Socks Off Service. Chip's articles have appeared in professional journals such as T&D Magazine, Training Magazine, and the Harvard Management Update. He has appeared on several major networks, and his work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, Forbes, USA Today, and Business Week. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today, Chip. Thank you, sir. I'm excited to be here and looking forward to talking about this important topic, and that is uh, how you can give the second greatest gift you can give another human being. Obviously, the first is the gift of love, and we're going to be focusing on uh, the gift of learning. And I think this is a relevant topic at a, a very critical time in the world of enterprise. I want to start in sort of a unique way, and it is a favorite quote of mine. Um, from the famous Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers uh, was a very gifted and famous psychotherapist, wrote many books, and this is taken from his book um, on, on Becoming a Person. And, and he says, uh, no one can teach anyone anything of significance. Now that's kind of an odd way to start talking about a learning experience, but he goes on to say, the goal of teaching or mentoring is to help another person remember, renew, and make ready to use. Think about those three words. Remember, meaning we are all plugged into the same universe of wisdom. To renew, to freshen up, uh, and obviously to put in a form that can be applicable. He goes on to focus on what we'll spend our time talking about today, and that is mentoring is not about the transmitting of knowledge. It is about facilitating discovery that leads to understanding. The outcome is understanding, which hopefully uh, can be applied in ways that are practical, powerful, and for the organization also profitable. But the goal is, is about the facilitation of discovery, that aha, that insight. And that's what we'll be uh, focusing on about the challenges of that and how to meet that challenge. So let me present uh, now uh, those uh, challenges that come with every mentoring relationship, the four challenges. Uh, of mentoring. And I think the first challenge reflected here on the screen uh, is the fact that learning is a door opened only from the inside. Think about that. It is the motivation of the learner, not the wisdom of the uh, mentor, uh, that, is the, that it is the key uh, to the relationship. Uh, so the challenge becomes for the mentor. What are ways I can create the kind of relationship uh, the kind of connection that will cause my protege, that's the word I'm going to use for the target of, of your learning, how do I get the protege uh, to want, feel, to feel comfortable, uh, to open that door, uh, to allow me in, to share my knowledge, and to facilitate insight. So that is the first challenge that we'll look at, is how do I get the protege to open that door? I think the second challenge that we'll be looking at uh, over the course of the next hour is the fact that uh, learning is all about taking risk. You know, it's, it, it, and, the, and the biggest part of that is I'm not just taking private risk, I'm taking public risk. How do I 
uh, make a fool out of myself and demonstrate I don't know and I don't understand and how, how do I act in a ways that uh, reflect my my uh, lack of knowledge or understanding in front of my mentor and so how do I create a if I'm a mentor how do I create a safe haven uh, and a comfortable environment where my protege uh, feels comfortable in taking the risk necessary uh, to grow and learn because we don't go from novice to mastery without mistakes, without error. And again, those will be happening in a way that's very public. So that's the second challenge we'll look at. The third challenge is, in many ways, the, the most difficult, and that is we're not just passing on information. We're not just conveying our knowledge and our expertise. We're trying to create insight. So what do I do to help the light go on? What do I do to create that aha? We call it insight, to see from the inside. So what do I do to make that light come on? So again, as we go forward, we'll begin to look at some of the ways uh, that we can help that occur. And the final challenge we have is what Carl Rogers referred to as make ready to use. And that is we're not just learning for learning's sake. We are learning for application. So what do I do as a mentor? to encourage and support the transfer of learning from our relationship uh, to application in the work world. Most organizations aren't willing uh, to write out a big check and pay for learning that has no possibility of any return. So we'll look for ways to say, how do I make it applicable in what I do? So those are the four challenges. How do I get that door to open from the inside? How do I foster, nourish, and nurture and encourage risk taking? How do I stimulate and, and facilitate insight? And how do I help uh, foster and nurture the transfer of learning? So we're now at our first check question, and that is, what are some reasons you think mentoring is vital today? I don't think it's just important. I think in our world today it is truly critical. So what are your thoughts about uh, the reason mentoring might be vital today? So we'll give you a sense to respond using your uh, chat window um, and so uh, and then and we'll begin uh, to take some of these uh, important questions that you are asking. And, 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 and I've already uh, got one coming in here. Um, uh, how do we foster and enable the transfer of learning uh, from Lori? We'll be looking at a little bit later in, uh, in, in the presentation. And, and, and one from Michael who says, uh, is there a role of employee loyalty? How do we, how do we ensure that? Uh, again, we'll be uh, we're looking at that. And this, I think, are really great, uh, strong reasons why it's important today. Um, part, part of the reason uh, Sheila has just pointed out is due to the number of baby boomers getting ready uh, to leave the organization. Uh, we really have to worry about uh, how much uh, talent we have left uh, in the organization. Uh, these are all great reasons. The retention of talent, the attraction of talent, um, it's, it's, it's sometimes as um, as Ronnie has pointed out, sometimes it's the only source of, uh, of education. Some have. Many organizations don't have the luxury uh, of uh, providing expensive learning. Again, there are many reasons uh, that I think uh, this is an important critical today, and thank you for sharing your insights and knowledge about uh, why it might be important. Let's continue on now and look at some of the learning objectives uh, for today. Uh, the first one I want to focus on is, is what's mentoring, really, and that won't take very long. Uh, the second is uh, what is the goal or aim of mentoring, and it's going to surprise you because it's not mastery, as you might think. What are the steps, I'm going to call them stages, in reaching that goal, and the thing we're going to spend the most time on, how do you mentor? Uh, what are the techniques uh, to take those steps? So let's look at our, our first uh, objective that I couched in the form of a question, and that is, what is mentoring really? I define mentoring as that part of the leader or coach's role that has learning as its primary outcome. We think of a leader as someone who influences others to achieve important goals. 
Uh, and, 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 and we think of a coach as someone who's about the business of nurturing and sustaining performance. So we're going to focus on that piece of the coach or learner's role that has learning as its primary focus. Now some of the techniques that you'll find in a coaching relationship are also relevant in a mentoring relationship, but as you'll discover, their application is a little bit uh, unique. So now let's look at our, our second objective, and that was what is the goal or aim of mentoring? And as I mentioned, it's not mastery. I think it's a partnership. It's a relationship. Think of learning as, as, a, as a never ending journey. Uh, you know, the half life on knowledge gets shorter and shorter, so we get to, need to keep people in a constant state of learning. So it's not about uh, mastery. As soon as I master something, very quickly it becomes obsolete. So it's all about that journey and how we facilitate that journey. And the mentoring might be uh, sort of a part of that journey, but at some point it's key that the mentor get off that uh, uh, journey so that the self-directed learner can continue on. So if we were to think of the, the features of a great mentoring partnership, uh, what might they be? And I, I, I think there are five. There's focus, family, feeling, freedom, and a shark. Now I'm going to start with that shark part because that kind of surprised you about what a shark would be doing. And, but, but it has to do with the arrows you see in the middle of the picture. I had a good friend of mine who was uh, in sales, and he uh, bought a new book called Swimming with the Sharks by Harvey McKay. And he thought it was the best book on selling he'd ever read. And he loved it so much, he went out and bought a shark. I mean, seriously, a little six-inch shark, and he put it in his aquarium in his apartment in Miami. Uh, and he named it Harvey after the author of the book. But as time went on, he got promoted and uh, transferred to Houston, and he was going to be on the road all the time, not just covering Miami. So he worried about who was going to take care of little Harvey. So he gave Harvey to SeaWorld in Orlando. Well, you know what they did. They put Harvey in a really, really big aquarium. Uh, well, a couple of years go by, three, and he gets married, and he, is, he and his wife decide to take a, a vacation to Disney World. And while they were there, they say, let's go over and check on little Harvey. Well, little Harvey had changed. Little Harvey was now almost six feet long, weighed almost 1,000 pounds. When I heard that story, I didn't think that was possible. And my friend who told me that story said, Google it. So I did. And apparently I learned from that is that certain animals, like humans, tend to grow commensurate with their environment. With their... And so in many ways, one of the goals is to create an expansive uh, relationship. And so the arrows sort of imply, how do I help learning, learn in lots of different directions? And I think it takes focus, meaning adults, unlike children, uh, need to feel like there's relevance and focus to their learning. You can teach a, a kid uh, a geometry and say, this geometry is not going to help you on the playground, but someday it's going to come in handy, and they're, and they're fine with that. But adults need to have a more immediate application, therefore focus is important. It's also important that relationship has a sense of feeling. We know from lots of research that learning that's, tend to be, that's retained tends to be anchored to the heart. Uh, you think of someone who was in a big war, uh, and they can tell you intricate details of, of, of uh, what their experiences were like in the, in the war, even if it might have been 40, 50 years ago, but can't tell you what happened two weeks ago. So we know that learning that's anchored to the heart tends to be uh, retained. So we're going to talk about how do we bring that element of feeling and emotion uh, into the partnership. And finally, the word feeling, family, is my word for partnership. Now, I know it's, it might sound challenging because particularly if you're the boss, how do you carry out an insight uh, goal from an in-charge role? But I think the whole focus of creating that level learning field where we are both learners together, a, a partnership implies reciprocity. As I'm helping you be the best you can be, I need your help in helping me uh, be the best I can be. So it's all about letting go and creating a relationship uh, that's focused on uh, learning together. So that sense of family uh, is the true essence of partnership. And finally, freedom. Freedom is all about letting go. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's about creating a self-directed learner, building a sense of independence uh, into that uh, learner as we go forward. So those are the partnerships, we're going to look now at our model that we'll be using the rest of the time, and that is what makes mentoring work? And, and what you see on the left-hand side are the stages, I'm going to call it, 
and, uh, and then on the right are some of the techniques that go with it. So we'll look at uh, four stages, all designed to cover one of those four challenges. Surrendering is, is, a, is a word that is used in the more eastern sense. In the west we call it surrendering means giving up. Uh, in the east it means joining, it means give, like a, being a part of a river. Uh, it's how do we join, how do we, uh, it's the opposite of control, and we're going to talk about authenticity uh, as a part of that. The second stage is about accepting, how do we create a safe haven for learning so risk taking occurs, and we're going to look at the word curiosity and courage as two techniques for doing that. Uh, finally, we'll look at uh, a gifting, uh, how do we share our gifts? and what are the things that tend to provoke uh, insight, uh, and we're going to look at advice and feedback and support uh, as tools for achieving that. And finally, uh, along our path of trying to create that independent learner, how do I extend the learning, transfer that learning beyond, and again, the role of insight uh, and inspiration uh, must come together. How do I create a joyful learner who's enthused about learning if the insight uh, is to continue? So let's look now at our next uh, question, and that is, in your view, what is the greatest relationship challenge of most mentors? And again, uh, the chat window is open, uh, and so uh, we, I'd love to hear from you about um, what you think of the next question, uh, the greatest um, challenge to mentors. We'll give you a few minutes to answer those, and then we'll continue on. We, 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 we are already getting uh, some great uh, responses that are coming in here and uh, that, are, that, are, that are very helpful. I think uh, Stephanie said trust is, a, is how do you build trust? How do you give and receive uh, feedback? Julia, how do we create an authentic relationship? Uh, Patty said how, how do we take the time to mentor? Um, and, 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 and open, how do you open, Lewis says, how do you open yourself? And, I, and, I, I, and, I, and listening, not talking, uh, as Cindy said, is, is another one. And not show favoritism. How do you take the, uh, it's time, the, the time, several of you mentioned time uh, as one of the key challenges. Uh, but I, but I want to pick up on the one Charles said, and that is uh, rapport and humility. Uh, and that is, um, I think, the greatest challenge. How am I able to truly be myself, to be authentic and be real? You know, remember I said earlier that uh, the, the great uh, mentoring relationships are about reciprocal learning. And I, I want my protege to take risk. And so what risk might I take? And I think the, the greatest risk that we have as mentors is to be authentic and be real and to be who we are and to role model that risk taking uh, in front of our protege. We're asking them to get on the high wire and take risk uh, in front of us. We need to be able to do that uh, as well. And so we're going to begin to look at how do I manage that uh, getting my protege to open the door from the inside. And I think it's authenticity. Uh, that opens doors, the realness, the humility, uh, the genuineness that we uh, demonstrate to our protege in our quest for creating a power-free relationship. The essence of a powerful relationship is it needs to be uh, free of authority and power. Um, and, and, and again, that comes up a lot in terms of how difficult it is uh, to create that sense of connection with authenticity. I used to do work with uh, a, 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 a Harley Davidson and one of the great people uh, in that organization was the CEO at that time, Rich Tierling. Uh, and he had a way of, of creating a power-free relationship and he would start off most of his meetings uh, with the words, here's something I screwed up on this week and what I learned from it. And then he'd invite his, 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 his other leaders, what, what did you screw up on this week? He wasn't trying to set somebody up to lose. What he was trying to do was to create an atmosphere that says, it's okay to make mistakes and starts with me as the leader. I'm willing to be, take my mask off and be real. 
in my quest to create a, a connection, a rapport. You know, that word rapport is so powerful because it comes from an old French word which means kinship. How do I create a kinship? You know, uh, speakers start off many times with a joke. Uh, salespeople, uh, you know, they begin, uh, they don't talk about features and benefits, they talk about the ball game or the weather. And, you know, you, you go see something, you go to a dinner party, you don't, you don't go empty handed. You usually bring a bottle of wine. Uh, or if you're my case, you might bring a bottle of Jack Daniels. But uh, the point is, all of those sort of gestures that we use in our everyday life are signals that beginnings in relationships might be difficult. And so how we create that, that connection, that rapport, that kinship uh, is, is one of the most powerful things we can do. Looking for ways to be real, to be authentic uh, in front of our, our protege. So let's think about what, what might be some of those surrendering techniques. And you see on your screen what I call the, uh, creating the heart and communicating with the heart of a host. And you think about what does a host do? A host is, a, is great at welcoming. Ho hosts are, are great at being attentive uh, to, to the needs of individuals. Um, hosts are great at creating a sense of, uh, of joy and acceptance uh, around uh, whatever they're hosting. And so I think it's much the same way. We need to uh, create a sense of connection. Um, be, being attentive like a great host might be. Modeling calm. You know, most protégés begin their relationship with a little anxiousness and a little apprehension. And, and sometimes out of that anxiety uh, tend to do, do demonstrate the opposite of confidence, uh, insecurity. And, and so it, it becomes a part of the mentor to help create and model that calm and confidence. To use open posture uh, and what I call eye hugs. Now you can probably take a, a, a pretty good idea about what that word means. but. Uh, it means looking at someone with a kind of look where your eyes are almost as if they're just reaching out and hugging somebody. It, it's, it's the look of acceptance, uh, the look of valuing, and that's what we'll be talking about. And, and, and being attentive to the pace and, and matching the, and pacing that individual, again, that's great work from neurolinguistic neuro programming, some of you may be forget, uh, familiar with, uh, NLP, and uh, the work of... Uh, Bandler and Grinder about watching great therapists at work and what they tended to do to get their patient in that situation to be open about their uh, challenges and, and, and they watched how well they were at matching and pacing the style and, and approach and t uh, pace of their uh, patients. And again, it's that same thought. And again, fundamentally, it's all the ways that we act to demonstrate that sense of partnership. But let's look now at, at, at uh, accepting. Again, we've created that first stage of, of that power-free relationship through all the ways in which we model authenticity and realness and genuineness. Now what we're about is I want to help that individual take risk to get on that high wire. And so how can I create a, a safe haven for learning uh, emotionally? Uh, and, and, and Carl Rogers talked about the unconditional positive regard as a way to demonstrate uh, true acceptance, it is the absence uh, of judgment. And so that's going to be our challenge now in the next one is how do I invite risk taking? And we're going to talk about the use of creativity, courage and curiosity uh, in how we do that. And I think it starts with uh, what I call using dramatic listening. Dramatic listening and listening without judgment. You know, most of us have been to family reunions. You know, and, or, or, or high school or college reunions. And reunions tend to have two things in common. You know, way too much food and probably a lot of superficial conversation. You know, you still living in, you still working for, but you probably had somebody in, at those reunions, maybe a, a, a relative or a friend, who didn't talk to you that way. They weren't interested in the superficial, unimportant stuff. They were interested in knowing about you. And you and you wanted to, and you walked away from those conversations where they talked about things were going on really in your life and what mattered most to you, and you walked away feeling not just heard, but you felt valued. Dramatic listening is the way we do that. Uh, dramatic listening doesn't mean ordinary listening. Dramatic listening means listening to your protege in a way that your protege feels not only heard and understood 
they also feel valued. They feel important. You know, I like to think about it like this. If you got arrested and you were on trial for being a poor listener, would your protege have the evidence that would get you released or acquitted? Now, when we ask it like that, it shifts from what we do to what they experience. That's what we're talking about, is how do we do that? And I, and I, I put on the screen now, I think, three techniques. And I know we, we all have classes on, on listening. Sometimes it's active listening. I'm thinking it one step beyond. And, and the first one you see is, I think great listeners use raffle listening, like, like this. If you were to raffle and they're raffling off a brand new red Corvette, you think you got the winning ticket and you're about there, about to call out that number at that raffle, you know you got that number. And a friend of yours who didn't buy a ticket, by the way, walks up and wants to carry on a conversation. What do you do? Well, you're going to be focused on the person reading that number, not your friend. So what I'm talking about is that we stay focused in what we do and how we listen. Total undivided attention. But it also means we need to look like we're listening. You know, I get feedback from my wife from time to time. She, she'll say, you aren't listening to me. And I go, I, I am listening to you. Ask me a question. And she often comes back and said, but you didn't look like you were listening. So it's not just what we're doing with our ears. It's what we're doing with our body language uh, that tells the other person that they're truly valued. You might be a wonderful listener, but if they aren't convinced, uh, then it's for naught. So again, we're looking at how do we create the kind of connection that, that, that makes me feel valued and therefore more willing to take those risks that result uh, in my learning. And finally, the last one is listening to learn. Listen to learn. You know, sometimes we listen with an agenda. And I remember when my son was in junior high school and he and I were carrying on a conversation. He, he Right in the middle of it, he said, why don't you quit being a daddy and just listen to me? And I, I was kind of taken aback and he said it again, why don't you quit being a daddy and just listen to me? And I suddenly realized what I was doing. I wasn't listening to learn. I was listening to make a point. I was listening to teach. I was listening to correct. I was looking to, for a new creative way to say that uh, two-letter word parents like to use with teenagers, you know. So again, we need to listen without an agenda, truly listen. Uh, you know, if I were to sort of summarize this, I would call it Cassie listening. Now, this next slide I'm going to show you is probably the most important one that I'm going to show you because this is my granddaughter. That's Cassie. I would think drop dead gorgeous and I hope you would agree. Um, Cassie's six years old and I, and I want to ask you this question. If you got uh, 10 minutes with Cassie and we got to watch you have that conversation with Cassie, what do you think we'd see? What, what would we see you do uh, in that 10 minute with Cassie? Well, let me see, take a, let me take a guess at some of the things that, that came to mind. And as I say these things, I want you to think about your connection with your protege. You'd probably be on her level. You'd probably be animated. You'd probably be totally focused on her. You would probably uh, truly listen because you were curious about what she's holding. That's turkey, by the way. Uh, her, her grandmother's all into crafts, and that's a turkey with a, uh, made with raisins and toothpicks and I'm sure you can see now uh, what she's holding. Uh, but you, you, would, you would be upbeat and animated and excited when you were with her. Now, what is the reason why I'm showing this photograph other than to show off my granddaughter? And uh, you might say that's not the reason I did it. No, no, really, I believe when we're communicating with an innocent child like Cassie, we bring our very, very best self into play. But my question is, what would it be like to your protege if that's the way you listened, like you brought your best self? But again, you remember when we started this, we said it's not just normal listening. We also are listening in a way that's judgment-free. It's conversations that are free of, of judgment because judgment gets in the way of our taking the necessary risk to result in learning. Let me give you an example. I, uh, I now live in Georgia after many years living in Texas, and I moved to Georgia for a couple of reasons. My grandchildren are all in Atlanta, but my mother is about two hours away, and my mother is uh, 98 years old. She's an assisted living facility two hours from me. I, I would say she's 
acting CEO of the assisted living facility, if you get my drift. And right after I moved uh, back, to, moved to Georgia, I went down to see her, and it's a drive that's about two hours long on a four lane that goes across the countryside. There are not a lot, no cities that you go through of any size, but it's all countryside. And some of the little towns along the path have decided to use the speed limit sign as a way to get more revenue. And uh, and so one of the first times I'm driving down there is I'm, I'm on this uh, four lane. It's Sunday morning. wasn't a cloud in the sky. wasn't a car on the road. And uh, I missed the sign that went from 65 to 45. And I have a little bit of a heavy foot, so I was going probably about 70. And it changed, and I never saw it and never realized that it changed and until I met a highway patrol. And he uh, saw me and uh, turned, drove across the medium, and came up behind me, and, uh, and and I already had my driver's license out and my insurance card, and he walked up to the front uh, of the, the side of my car, and I want you to think about what do you think he said to me? No, he didn't say, "Do you know how fast you were going?" No, he didn't say, "Where's the fire?" What he said was, "Mr. Bell." Is there an emergency I need to get know about? Is there an emergency I need to go know about? Now, I, I t did I get a ticket? I, I, you guarantee you, I got a ticket, a very large ticket for, for speeding. But I wrote a letter of commendation uh, on his behalf to the highway patrol. That's what I mean by that sense of judgment-free query. His focus was to assume innocence. There must be some reason this fool's driving 25 miles hour, hour, hour above, the, uh, above the speed limit. And so that's what I'm talking about, judgment free. Assume innocence in the conversation because we know the way in which judgment and how we listen without judgment affects the quality of learning. Let me share with you uh, what I'm talking about, about listening without judgment and how your brain actually impacts learning. Uh, this is a picture of your brain. Uh, you learned about this in ninth grade general science or tenth grade biology. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to focus on two parts of your brain. Uh, the first part of the brain is the cerebrum. It's the largest part of your brain. It's the part of the brain you use to learn for analysis, for logic, for creativity. It's the part you learn to figure things out. Uh, and the biggest part of your brain, again, uh, the oldest part of your brain the, it's called the amygdala. Uh, it's the reactive part. It's the instinctive part. It's the fight-flight part. It's the part that triggers adrenaline. Now, when you experience uh, anything in life, uh, as you're doing right now in this webinar, it takes two routes. It takes a slow route to the cerebrum, and it takes a much faster route to the amygdala. The point is, everything you experience in your life, your amygdala, gets it first. Now, your amygdala is connected to the cerebral. That probably sounds like a camp song, doesn't it? When the individual senses danger, so, so think of the amygdala as a clearinghouse. When the individual senses danger, it sort of a, sounds an alarm and sends a message up to, to, the, to the cerebrum to ignore forthcoming message and shuts down that cerebrum by as much as two-thirds. Well, you might say, why would it do that? Well, you might imagine many moons ago, caveman out tooting along, having a nice day, goes around this corner and encounters this mean, ugly, saber-toothed tiger. Well, if he said, let me see, Danny said, if I saw one of these, was it moved to the left or was it moved to the right? If he went through all that figuring out process, what happened? Well, he got eaten. So the brain learned uh, that in certain situations, the cerebrum, the thinking part of the brain, is a liability. So it learned to shut it down and deal with it totally instinctively, totally that reptilian part of the brain. Well, we don't live in a saber-toothed tiger world anymore, but your brain works today pretty much like it does, like it did then. That's why when your boss comes in sometimes and goes, what the hell is this? That's probably a saber-toothed tiger to your brain, and you find yourself, you can't think, you can't remember. Well, actually, today it's not danger that makes that phenomenon occur. It used to be physical harm. Now, 
Uh, most organizations have policies against supervisory cannibalism. Uh, people don't get punched out of the water cooler. So now it's not about physical harm, it's about emotional harm. It's about the perception on this part of that individual that they are about to be a victim, like your protege. Now what does victim mean? It could mean a number of things. I'm going to look stupid in front of my boss or in front of somebody that, I, that matters to me. I'm going to lose face. I'm going to lose control. You won't like me. You won't respect me. You won't promote me. So again, all the things that we do to help minimize the potential of that experience of victim, I look stupid. How we listen without judgment actually imp impacts the, the brain in a way that affects the, the diminishes the ability to learn because most of the learning we have today is not uh, amygdala kind of learning, reactive kind of learning. Most of what we learn requires logic, creativity, analysis, and the ability to figure things out. So again, there's even a physiological basis for how we listen and how we do that in a way that doesn't have a sense of judgment. But I want to move to the other part. I said we're going to focus on curiosity as a way to show acceptance, to encourage risk-taking that results in learning, as well as courage. And what we mean by courage is how do I create uh, a, a sense of, of safety? And, and, and I like to think about it as supporting failing on purpose. Each one of those words has powerful meaning. Support failing on purpose. Now, the first meaning is this. You want to be, as a mentor, encouraging your protege to fail on purpose. Intentional error. You know, now, you don't want them to be foolhardy or, or, or uh, anything like that. But, you know, most of us have uh, comfort zones about three sizes too small. So we've got to expand their comfort zone if they're uh, to learn. And we know that great learning doesn't happen without error, without mistake, without falling. And so encouraging them to make mistakes that result in learning. But the second meaning of this quote, this phrase, is failing on purpose, meaning failing consistent with principle, failing consistent with our values. Again, it's not about reckless, foolhardy uh, failing. You know, if, 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 if quality is important to me, to, to, the, to, to your uh, organization, what would quality plus look like? If going the extra mile on behalf of your customers, what would a mile and a half look like? So it's encouraging people consistent with your virtues, values, principles, and purpose that we fail in that direction. But perhaps the most important word in this phrase is the word support. And that is, you're inviting your protege to get on that high wire and take mistake, make mistakes. When they do, what happens? Will you be the net to catch them? Asking someone, inviting someone to take, uh, to, to, uh, take risk and then failing uh, to be there when they make that mistake is, is not fair. And so we need to provide a support. When you make a mistake, I'm going to be here for you. And so again, that's part of the role of an effective mentor, obviously of a leader as well, uh, is how we show that courage. But we're going to move now and look at our next piece, and that is gifting. Now, where we are, we talked about it starts with surrendering, how we create that sense of power-free relationship joining the flow, not controlling, and how realness and authenticity play. We've talked about accepting. How do I create that safe environment for risk-taking? We looked at how curiosity and courage help achieve that. Now we're at the main event, because really it's all about fostering that insight. What Carl Rogers talked about is fostering discovery. And we're going to look at a few ways in which we do that. There are many more gifts than ones you see on the screen. But these are some that we'll be talking about now. You might say, hey, 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 Chip, why didn't we just start here? Why do I have to go through all this surrendering and accepting stuff? Why don't I just start with advice and feedback? Why, why, not, why not begin there? Because it doesn't work. People try it all the time with you. When was the last time somebody came up and said, let me give you some advice? Were you excited? Did you think, oh, boy, I'm about to get a present? Hey, I need to give you a little feedback. I don't think you were really excited about that. So we need to create a readiness for those gifts. And a surrendering and accepting is a part of that relationship 
helps build that readiness, that sense of, I'm here for you. I'm here to provide this for you. Uh, there's no ulterior motive in what I'm doing. I'm doing it because I value your learning. So again, gifting is a central part, and gifting is what we're going to focus on to create uh, the insights uh, and make those insights. We're going to look now at the probably the most common and most familiar, uh, and that is how do I give advice? But you notice there's more to that than just advice giving. It is giving advice without resistance. That's the hard part. How do you give advice that doesn't get resistance? So if you look up the word, a mentor in the dictionary, it'll probably say something like a, a sensitive, trusted advisor. So advice is one of the most uh, important pieces and gifts that we give to create that insight and discovery. So what we're going to do is look now at uh, how we do that. Uh, and I have what I think of as a four-step, four-and-a-half-step process. Uh, and if you follow these four-and-a-half steps, I'll guarantee you your protege will hear your advice. I can't guarantee you they'll take it, but the challenge often is it seems to go in one ear and out the other. And so how do we make sure that it is heard uh, and, and, and valued? So step number one is to acknowledge the performance problem or learning goal. That lets them know what the advice is going to be about. It sort of tags the subject. And usually when you're given advice, it's either about a performance problem, something's not working, or a learning goal, something's missing, something needs to be added. So we need to focus on uh, here's the reason uh, we want to provide this advice. The second step is get their agreement that improvement is important. Because unless they're committed to make an improvement, all the advice in the world is not, going, is not going to be very helpful. But the most powerful step you see is number three. And that is ask permission to give advice. Now, it doesn't sound like, may I have your permission to give you advice? No, no. It sounds like, you know, I've got an idea that might be helpful if that if that'd be useful to you. Or, I've got, a, I've got a thought if you'd like to hear it. It is, it is now, it's, it's say, you know, well, well, why, why we do this? Well, the reason is that most of the time advice is resisted because we feel like we're being controlled, we're being coerced. So if you ask permission to give advice, you're taking the control, coercion out of it. But the next piece has to go with it, step four. State your advice in first person singular. What I found helpful was work for me, not what you ought to do, what you should do. I remember who used to use words like that. Because now we're back into the controlling. Uh, and, and so again, that and we get resistance. So study it in first person singular. And finally, the half step is get feedback on the usefulness of your advice. Now that's going to be beneficial to you. And remember, I call it a half step because it's more for you than for them, obviously. But it also is in the spirit of that partnership. I want to give good advice going forward so you can help me be a better uh, mentor in how I give advice. So follow these steps. But there's another one we're going to focus on, and that is feedback plan for growth. You know, if you think about the word feedback and you slow it down, feedback, the connotation is about nurturance. It's about performance fertilizer. And in many ways, that's what we're talking about. How do I manage my feedback that's focused on ensuring a sense of, of growth. Let me give you an interesting example. I spent a part of my early career as an as a infantry company commander in, in, in Vietnam, and, and I depended a great deal on the, on the artillery when you're in combat. Now, that's not going to be some grown a war story. But uh, here's, here's how combat artillery works. Now, let's pretend these are good guys, friendly troops. Uh, obviously, if they were really in combat, they wouldn't be uh, lined up like that or that close together. And let's pretend that off in the distance is a real enemy, ta ugly enemy tank. Uh, it just so happens that uh, one individual with this infantry unit is called a forward observer. Serves as the eyes for the artillery back in the rear supporting uh, this unit. Uh, cannons are called howitzers now, but cannons are fine. And right beside the cannon is a little building called the FDC, the Fire Direction Center. Now, the way the process works, now keep in mind that the distance between the tank and the artillery piece could be two or three miles. And so, <coughs> excuse me, even if the forward observer had gotten LASIK surgery, you know, the, I mean, if the gunner had gotten LASIK surgery, he still couldn't see that tank three miles away, so he depends on the observer forward his position. And so typically what happens is 
they uh, ask for a, a artillery round and it's fired and let's pretend it goes off somewhere there. Now the fire observer's got to call in corrections and it gets dropped 100, left 100, which means if that round had landed 100 meters down and 100 meters to the left, it it blow that tank off the face of the globe. There's only one problem. The gunner uh, pulling the lanyard on this artillery piece, meters doesn't mean anything. So it gets called back to the fire direction center that very quickly translates distance out in the boondocks into turns on this artillery piece. So he hollers out the door, two turns up, two turns over, which tells the gunner to move out, big, move these wheels, that move this heavy barrel up and over, and they fire the next shot, hopefully close to the target. Well, you can imagine how frustrating it would be to the gunner if the forward observer uh, saw the first round land and called back, well, you missed, you know, or uh, that was a lousy shot, or, well, that was better than last week. You know, feedback, feedback is information. Information that comes back, first of all, clear in language the person can follow, and useful in a way that they can turn it into action, and obviously quick, quickly. And so as we think about giving feedback, think about these principles. Is it clear? Is it useful? Is it given quickly? So I can begin to associate it with my actions. Feedback is one of the most central and critical ways and gifts that we give uh, to our protege. But we're going to look now at our next piece, and that is support, because support begins to build in the next challenge. And our final challenge that we have is that how do I enable the transfer of learning? Because remember, Carl Rogers said, I want to make sure we uh, renew and make ready to use. And so this is all about the ready to use part. How do I in enable that transfer of learning? How do I make application? And I want to provide a, an interesting one, and that is part of what I need to do is learn to help eliminate the restrictive patterns, especially the mental ones, between your protege's ears. Because I'm building a path toward their toward the independence and, and where they go. And, and, and one of the biggest challenges that we have is mental patterns that get in the way of learning new things. You know, learning is about breaking patterns. Learning is about uh, finding new, new ways of seeing things. And obviously, the way we've always done things can be an inhibited challenge uh, to the kind of learning uh, that we think uh, is important. Let me, let me give you a quick illustration of how quickly we can spot a pattern uh, in our brain. Now, you look at this slide, and the first time you look at it, it just looks a mess. You know, like there's no way I can read that. And then, then you realize, not only can I read it, I mean, I can read it fast. See, that's a pattern. We're our main, main, that's what our brain does. And again, learning is all about how do we help eliminate the restrictions of the way we've always done it kind of pattern. Let me give you a fun Count every square you see. You know, count every single one of the squares you see. Now, I'll give you a few minutes just to count them, and uh, I'm sure some of you go, well, I've, I've done this before, and so I know what the answer is. But I'll give you a few minutes. But the, are the instructions clear? It's pretty clear. You know, the, the, so if I went, I'll, I'll take you out of your misery, so to speak. If I went one square high, one square wide, I got 16, we kind of see those immediately, right? If I go two squares high, two squares wide, there's actually nine of those, okay? You, you can see that one right there, that two by two square, and you can probably see that one uh, right there. You, there's nine of the two by two squares, right? So we're, we're, we're doing good along here. There's, if you go three squares high, three squares wide, there's four. So there's that one. Some of you may have seen that one. And there's that one. Uh, and there's that one. And there's that one. So now we're up to uh, 29. And if I go four squares high, four squares wide, I got 30. And, but, but there's a lot more squares. Because this is in itself a pattern in your brain immediately. And it, you're thinking to yourself, Chip, if, if you'd give me a little more time, I could have seen all 30 of those. And you would have. You would have. But there's more squares. And this is the point of learning. This is where learning begins. And your brain's not going to like the next one I'm going to show you. But once you see this one, you can see many, many, many more. So this is the next one. You see, your brain didn't like that. You know, the word square, the oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, because it didn't like breaking patterns. And our job as a mentor, as a protege, as a, as a mentor is to help that protege 
see that other square. But now that you see that square, can you see any other squares? You know, you're, you're probably uh, sitting in front of a screen that's square. You're probably sitting in front of a, you know, a desk that's square. You've probably got tiles on the, floor, on the ceiling that are square. So if you look around the room, all of a sudden, we see a lot more. So that's the purpose. How do I support that kind of breaking those restrictions? And, and so, so what do we do? That? You know, I, I think of it as, as we need an abundance of what ifs. What if, what if, what if, what if. That's part of what we do. As a mentor, we always ask him, what if you did this? What if you used trial? What if you piloted? What if we do prototype experiments? I like the next one, the Green Weenie Award. I work with an organization that gives the annual Green Weenie uh, to the individual who made the biggest screw up while doing their very best that represented the greatest organizational learning. It's a badge of courage in that organization. It says we want to reward uh, this kind of excellence, even if it doesn't work sometimes. We want to make learning feel like play. As we know it's playful, we tend to see beyond just the obvious. But I like the next one, and it's one of my favorites, and that is treat your protege as Alice's father did. Now this is obviously taken from uh, Alice in Wonderland. You may have seen the movie with uh, Johnny Depp. And uh, right at the very beginning, Alice is laying in bed, and her daddy's putting, put, putting her to bed. And uh, she's telling him about all the weird things that she'd seen with a uh, rabbit in the waistcoat and, and uh, uh, purple caterpillar. And he's, she's telling him. And then she asks him if we're going to actually get to see the movie in a second. And then he asks, she asks this important question, do you think I've gone round the bed? That's an old British English way of saying, do you think I've gone crazy? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at Alice and her conversation. But I'll tell you a secret. All the best people are. And if you remember later on in the movie, when she is having a, a banquet with the Mad Hatter, played by Johnny Depp, she asked that same question. He asked her that same question, do you think I've gone around a bend? And she remembered and used her dad's line, yes, but all the best people are. So again, it's all the affirming that we provide that is critical, which leads me to our last point. And that is part of how we help build that self-directed learner, that uh, protege independence, is how we learn to praise without critiquing. You've noticed a theme throughout. I remember when my son was uh, in junior high school. He's historically done well in school. And he came home uh, at the end of the first grading period in junior high school. And on his report card, he had uh, three A's and a C. Well, I don't know how C's go over at your house, but I'm not a fan of C in anything in life, so we had a little this conversation about his report card. Um, and I told him how happy I was by, about his A's, but I was concerned about his C. Well, what do you think he remembered out of that conversation? Daddy didn't even talk about my A's. And I know what I did. I know what I, I know what did. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I got some mentoring from the individual standing in the hallway listening to my conversation with him, and I thought, if I'm here again, I'm going to do this a little bit different. Well, I got my opportunity. The next grading period, he came home with the same report card. In fact, it was worse. He had three A's and a C, but the C was in a completely different subject than the first semester. But I thought, I'm going to do this different. So I sat down with him, and I told him how happy I was about his A's, and I got up and I was about to walk out of the, out of the room, and I, he said, Daddy, what about the C? And I said, Son, I saw you got a C, and I want to talk about that. But right now, I just want to let you know how happy I am and about what great work you did with your A's. Well, I went on out of his room. The next morning, he came down for breakfast, and he said, Daddy, I want to talk about that C. 
And then he surprised me. And he said, you know, Dad, I got a lot of ideas about what I can do next time to bring it up. All of a sudden it hit me. When you separate those conversations, you give that individual a chance to glow and grow. You give them a chance to glow from the affirmation about the best people are, but you also give them a chance to grow. See, my style would have been to rattle off four things he could do different. He came up with that. I didn't come up with it. And the next grading period, he got uh, three A's and a B in the last grade, all, all last semester, all gray, all A's, last grading period, all A's. I take no credit, but when we create that opportunity to separate them, praise without critique, praise, we don't want to rush in and say, yeah, you're doing a good job, but the but erases the yes. Look for ways to provide that opportunity to glow and grow because your objective is that protege uh, independence, helping them continue on that journey of learning uh, uh, independently. Now, this is our summary. Uh, we talked about the main objective we had was what are the techniques? How do you make mentoring work? And we've looked now at, at four stages to each design to address a different challenge. I get my protege to open the door from the inside by how I create a relationship that is collaborative, that's a partnership, that's, that's my being real and authentic. And so I'm creating that sense of I'm, I'm truly caring about your learning. And more apt, they will open that door for me. My second challenge as a mentor is creating that uh, risk-taking environment by how I show acceptance. Acceptance builds a safe environment. And how I show that is the way I show uh, curiosity, that I'm truly interested in, in my protege. And, and, but also, the way I both model and foster courage on the part of that individual. People encourage you by, as a way to show acceptance. And when we feel like we're under the uh, under the leadership of someone who's constantly encourages us, it makes us want to take more risk. And then we got to the main event, gifting, all the ways that we use to promote insight, that discovery. And we've talked about how to give advice without resistance, how to provide feedback plan for growth, and how do I support thinking beyond and going outside the boxes. Um, but, but last one is how do I extend the learning? How do I ensure that transfer of learning? How do I create learner inspiration? And in the end, it's all about a joyful learner. How I demonstrate that, and part of the role that you play in being a joyful learner is key to helping them feel that sense of being valued. Rosabeth Moss Cantor, professor at Harvard Business School, said leaders are more powerful role models when they learn than when they teach. And so the more we demonstrate a sense of being a joyful learner, the more we encourage our protege to do likewise. It has been a joy to be with you. And now I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Wonderful. Chip, your presentation here today and sharing all of your insights and your stories has really been, been wonderful. Thank you so much for partnering with us. Uh, it's been a, been a great session. My pleasure. Thank you so much. If you do have questions for Chip, please go ahead and enter those into your chat window right now. Um, we'll go ahead and collect all of those, and um, then we'll capture those. Chip will respond, um, and then we'll email that out to everyone um, uh, next week. So you will receive responses to all of those, so go ahead and send them in. And please stay in touch. Um, HRDQU um, has upcoming webinars, so take a look at those for some uh, additional speakers. And um, our store here has some training resources for you, too. Chip has several ways to connect with him through email, um, through Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and social media through his website. So take a look at that. And don't miss out on his book, um, Managers as Mentors. And for your time today, thank you so much for joining us. We do invite you to take 10% off your order at hrdqstore.com. HRDQ brings you the best in assessments, games, workshops, um, even simulations for instructor-led classroom learning, as well as e-assessments and e-learning for distance training. You can take advantage of this offer and stock up on any training needs you may have. It's coupon code WebinarMM 
and that is good through August 13th, 2014. And that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us, and we hope you found today's webinar informative.